Hey friends, and welcome in to A Walk Through the Word, Daily Bread with Crystal Fry. I am your host, Crystal Fry, and this week's guest conversation was an absolute delight. It brings together two of my great loves, faith and music. My guest this week is Dave Combs, songwriter, photographer, entrepreneur, and author with four decades of experience writing over 120 songs, including the one that you're hearing right now, Rachel's Song, and creating 15 albums of soothing, relaxing, instrumental piano music. His beautiful music has been played millions of times worldwide on radio, satellite, and internet streaming media, and it continues to touch the lives of millions of people all over the world. He is also the author of best-selling new book, Touched by the Music, How the Story and Music of Rachel's Song Can Change Your Life. We talk about the impact of faith in Dave's life and how one inspired song can change everything. He shares the story of how Rachel's song came to be and the impact it has had on countless lives around the world. I hope you enjoy this episode and be sure to check out the show notes to connect with Dave through his website and to check out his beautiful music and new book. And we have a special treat for you after our conversation, so make sure you stick around for that. All right, friends, here we go. God's Word is powerful. The missing link is our identity in Christ. When we know who we are and who He created us to be, That is when we can truly walk in freedom. You are never alone. There is hope, and that hope is Jesus Christ. Well, Dave, thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. You have such an incredible story, and I cannot wait for our listeners to hear it. But as we're getting started, if you'll do me a favor, for any of our listeners who may not be familiar with you, give us a little introduction and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Dave Combs, C-O-M-B-S, and I was born in East Tennessee, uh, up in the mountains, and uh, Grew up in a musical family, musical community. (laughs) Actually, I guess you could call Tennessee a musical state with Nashville being the uh, Music City USA. In fact, I I think that it is a state law that someone in living in Tennessee has to play an instrument. I believe that's I believe that's state law. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, so I grew up in East Tennessee around music, around uh, especially in my church. You know, I'm a Baptist, so I went to Calvary Baptist Church from the time I was born, practically. So uh, I grew up with choir music and uh, learned to play the piano early in life uh, by taking music and also from learning from my father, who played by ear. And But I eventually was able to play the piano well enough to where they would let me occasionally play the piano during a, wor- a worship service, say for an offertory or something like that. And I got better and better. And then eventually I got into the choir, of course. I love choral music and I loved conducting choral music. I was as a a senior in high school occasionally when the minister of music was gone. Dave, would you you fill in for so-and-so? And And I, well, okay, I was nervous as I could be. You remember the first time you ever sang a solo in church? Oh, how nervous you are, but you get over that. So I I was able to conduct the choir and, and later on, when I was in college, my last two years in college, the minister of music left, and they asked me to be the part-time minister of music in my church. So I, I loved, you know, conducting the choir, and you know, I loved performing all those John W. Peterson cantatas at Easter and Christmas time, and thank, you know, all the special times of the year. And 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 another story we can talk about later. But I I eventually got to meet John W. Peterson in person, in his wow. home spent some time with him. So anyway, so music has been a big part of my faith and my, my, my Christian life and my family. My wife, Linda, and I met basically through music and found out that we had almost everything in common. She was uh, had played the piano at her church when she was a little girl. And so, you know, it's 
the, the connections and the interconnections of lives and, and our church and our faith is, is so important. So, so I am a person uh, that loves music, has all my life, and I'm so blessed that eventually I was able to turn and do my music full time, beginning when I was like, uh, I guess in 19 and 92, I had been working for a long 22 and a half years at AT and T in a technical job. You know, I was a computer programmer. I'm a math major, physics minor in college, so I'm one of those, you know, left brain technical, analytical people, and computer programmer. But music has always been an important part of my life, and and we're going to talk about it. But uh, the song, Rachel's song, that will be the one we'll focus on to start with is what got it all turned around for me and put me on a path that was eventually led to a full-time music and spreading my music around the world. So I'm all about, now I'm all about music and trying to spread peace and happiness and soothing music all around the world. I love that so much. And I can't wait to get into the story of Rachel's song. And I know we are going to touch on that. And that for our listeners, that is the song that you heard in the introduction to today's podcast episode. Well, I'm going to ask you my favorite question to ask our guest. And you've already touched on it a little bit. So I think our listeners kind of have an idea. But Dave, tell me, how has your faith impacted your life? Well, I think my faith and my trust in God and my uh, being a Christian and around the body of Christians and through at church and my family and our uh, all our friends and that kind of thing, that has kind of kept me grounded and focused and centered on what I should be doing. And, you know, to go from a, a career of technology and whatever to to leave that behind and take a leap of faith and go into doing your own thing with your music full time, boy, that took a lot of faith because oh, I can remember and the story of how I made that decision is a wonderful story. Then the reprint of it is on my website. It's it's in the Guidepost magazine. It's just look for Guidepost article under articles in my on my website. But it is the story of how I came to realize that my music was what I was put on this planet to do and that I needed to get on with it. And uh, that little story also launched me in another direction too because Guidepost is a huge magazine with 2 million plus subscribers and it just, and it, I got inundated with responses. Uh, I heard from over 10,000 people in two weeks. Wow. Phone, my phone rang, would not stop ringing. My phone rang constantly. I had to hire two people just to answer the phone. And so, but that was all because of my little testimonial article in this about how my, I made my, how I wrote Rachel's song and what that did and how it enabled me to get my job in 1992. And uh, just an amazing story. And it's apparently an inspirational story that still inspires people. And we'll make sure that the link to that story is in the show notes so that our listeners can go, mm -hmm. they can have a direct link into that. We'll make sure that that is down there. So let's jump into this story about Rachel's song. How did this come about? Because this was the catalyst that really launched you into the direction that God intended for you to be. And so tell us about Rachel's song. Well, one of the things that I've always done I guess most most of my life since I could play the piano was when when and I want to relax and just chill out. I sit down at the piano and play something. You may do the same thing with you know sit down and I know you're a singer and uh, do you play a piano by the way? I am only skilled only in playing handbells. Um, I oh, okay. do not actually read music, at least not enough to be able to play an instrument. I would love to, and maybe one day I will, but well, God gifted me with voice and appreciation, not necessarily the coordination to make the music on an instrument. <laughs> well, that's, that's just fine. I, I can tell by the, I, I can tell from talking with you that having been a choir director, you, you would have been a wonderful member of my choir. I can tell that. Thank you. <laughs> so anyway, this one of my ways of relaxing my primary way of relaxing is to sit down at the piano and play something and it you know sometimes i'll turn on the radio and just try to play along with whatever's on the radio or put my favorite sheet music up there and play it 
Well, this one time, this was in January of 1981. This is 42 years ago. I suspect you may not have been around at that time. Um, I was born in 82. Okay, so this was the one year before you were born. And I was sitting at my piano that evening after work, and I sat down and I played this, I just played this song. I know you may have heard this before from other songwriters that, that sometimes songs just seem to appear. You don't sit down and write them. You don't even think about it. You just, they, the song appeared. I played the song on the piano. Didn't think anything about it. Didn't even write it down or anything. I just played it. And I played it from beginning to end. And I do remember as I played it, I could, I felt and could hear what, the next part of the song was. In other words, it was as if it were a popular song that I was playing, but it wasn't. So I played the whole song beginning to end, never changed. To this day, it hasn't changed. And so a couple of days later, my wife, Linda, comes home from her job and she says, Dave, what is this song that I have stuck in my head all day long? You know how you get an earworm and you can't, can't get it out of your head. She hummed a little bit of it. And I said, well, it doesn't have a name. And she says, what? You play it on the piano all the time. What's the, it's got to have a name. I said, no, it's just something that I made up. Well, she got all excited and said, well, have you written it down? I said, no, I've, I've got it in, up here. It's not going anywhere. I won't, I won't forget it. She said, oh, no, something might happen to you, and that song would be gone. I, you have got to write it down. I said, okay, yes, ma'am, I will write it down. So I got a piece of paper and sure enough, I wrote it down and I have in my hands here, I know this is an audio audible, audio only, but it's a piece of paper with just the music notes and the chords written across the top and copyright David M. Combs, 1981. So I did write down the melody and the chords on a piece of paper. So this, and notice it doesn't have a name. It's just, just, the, just the melody. So that's in the piano bench now, and so it's we're happy, and uh, this was in 1981. Roll the calendar forward a couple of years, and some good friends of ours have a little baby girl named Rachel. They ask me and Linda to be her godparents, and so at little Rachel's christening service, Linda and I are sitting there in this little country church, and it's just us and the family and the minister, and up on the front platform of the church in the middle, was a baby grand piano. Well, I'm sitting there, we're listening to the wonderful, beautiful service about little Rachel. And toward the end, I punched Linda and I said, hey, you know that little song that I've been, we've been trying to name and can't think of a name for? How about I play it as part of the service here? She said, oh, that's a great idea. So at, once they finished the formal part of the service, I went up to the family and ask if it'd be okay if I played a song on the piano. And they said, of course, yes. Everybody sat back down and I went over to the piano and sat down and started playing this song. And I got most of the way through it and I hear this <clears throat> clearing throats and little sniffles here and there. And, and I noticed my eyes were beginning to get a little moist as well. And well, you know, a little christening service for a cute little precious baby is precious anyway. Yes. Well, you put on top of that a, a beautiful touching song on top of it. And boy, the, you can just turn on the teardrops. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of the song, I looked over at little Rachel in, in the arms of her mother. And I said, from now on, this song will be called Rachel's song in her honor. Wow. And that's how it got its name. And it was just, it was just meant to be. That was, that song was meant to be called Rachel's song. So that's how it got its name. And then you think, well, okay, now what? Well, I played it, of course, oftentimes. And uh, it was something we were kind of thinking, what can we do with this song? Well, one of my jobs at Western Electric, at the time, Western Electric was a former subsidiary of AT&T. Well, that, I worked for Western Electric. And it was the manufacturing arm of the Bell system back then. And we had a factory that I was have, needing to work at during the week in Nashville, Tennessee, of all places. This was meant to be too. And so here I am working in Nashville, Tennessee. And Linda says, well, Dave, 
you're in Nashville, Music City, USA. Why don't you go and get a recording made professionally of Rachel's song? You know, they'll do a demo recording. Ah, okay, I can do that. So one evening after work, I go driving around downtown Nashville and looking for a studio. I go over into the part of town that they call Music Square. It's kind of a four, two or three square block area with everything in it just has to do with music. There's the Country Music Hall of Fame. There's the RCA studios that you can go tour and all those kind of things. Well, I go down this one little side street called Roy Acuff Place. Now, Roy Acuff was a very much loved, famous country music person in Nashville. And they named a street after him. So I'm going down Roy Acuff Place. And at the end of the street is a big building with a barn-shaped roof. And on the street corner is this big old water wheel like they had moved it from a literal mill mill somewhere and on the side of the building it says the music mill i said okay clever okay so i pull in the parking lot and i look through the glass door and i see a man sitting at a desk in the lobby okay i mean look i mean look it's about you know it's after hours so i was lucky to find somebody i thought so i knock on the door and he unlocks it and opens the door and he says, hello, I'm George Clinton. Can I help you? And uh, no, it's a different George Clinton than I know you're the, the thought. Just the picture just crossed your mind right there. There are lots of George Clintons, apparently. This George Clinton was a recording engineer that worked there at the music mill. Well, he introduced himself and I told him I was looking for a studio. And he says, well, come on in <laughs> and he invited me in and I I looked over to my left in this big two-story lobby, and up here on the wall was a huge life, it might even be bigger than a life-size picture of Glenn Campbell. And then in front of me was a huge big picture of the group Alabama, you know, the, wow. the, the, the wonderful group Alabama. And the Forrester Sisters picture over here, and there was gold records and platinum records framed around the walls, you know, they were really, uh, lots of things that they were really proud of. And so I thought, wow, this is a classy place. Told George, I said, I have never been in a recording studio before. He said, no problem. He said, you're in luck. Nobody is recording right now, which is very unusual. He said, let's go over into studio A and let me give you a tour. Okay. So he took, took me over into studio A, the big room where the musicians go. You could put an orchestra in that room. And it was, it was a huge, big room you know, hardwood floor, and it was it was just a great place to put musicians. Big nine-foot Steinway grand piano over in the corner and, you know, isolation booth rooms around the side. And he said, let's go over into the, re the control room. Let me show you where all the, the engineer works. So let me show you my office. <laughs> so we go in this, and he, he opens this big, thick door. It's about, I don't know, six, eight inches thick, soundproof door. And so we go step into the control room. First thing I see is this console, the control console. It is about eight feet long. It has rows and rows of knobs and sliders and switches and just an impressive console. And it looked to me like you could launch a spaceship from that thing. <laughs> and then there were tape recording machines around the wall and then over the they had a big picture glass soundproof window that you could look out into where the musicians were and see them and then there was this huge monitor speakers on each side of the window and you know it was obviously a classy place where they could make i could just imagine the wonderful music that had been made in that room i said george how much does this place cost to rent he said it's 125 dollars an hour plus engineer now this was 1986. In today's dollars, that's over $500 an hour. So yeah. that is expensive because <laughs> I didn't make anywhere close to that back then. So I'm sure George saw my face kind of go, oh no, I can't do this. And he says, Dave, don't worry about it. He said, the guy that owns this studio owns a tiny little studio across the street in what used to be a little rent house. They converted to a studio. It's got a little baby grand Yamaha piano and a, a control room that's got, it'll handle like 16 or 24 tracks or something like that. It's a smaller version. And he said, it's $15 an hour plus engineer. <laughs> that was my reaction exactly. I can do this, yes. Okay, George, 
All I need now is a musician that can play my song. And it's, it's just a simple little piano piece. And I said, I just need a really good piano player. He thought for a second, he said, hey, I know just the person for you. His name is Gary Prim, P-R-I-M. And he said, I've known Gary forever. He and I go to church together. He's a wonderful piano player, great session musician. Everybody loves Gary. I said, okay, well, he said, let's go back to my desk. I'll look his phone number up. So he wrote his number on a piece of paper, gave it to me. I thanked him profusely and I went out and jumped in my rental car and I hightailed it back to the hotel so I could call Gary. Now you may say, well, why didn't you call him on a cell phone? That's this 1986. was 86. <laughs> uh, let's see, cell phones, I, nobody would know what that even meant. And the internet hadn't even been invented by then. Emails were, didn't exist then. So this was, I had to go back to the hotel to a landline to call Gary. I did, called him, got his answering machine. And in about 30 minutes, he called me back. And he said, this is Gary Prim, can I help you? I said, yep, George Clinton said, you'd do a great job of a demo of a song I've written. He said, I'll be glad to. What do you need from me, Gary? Well, let's see, he said, I only need two things. He said, you just send me a tape recording of you playing it, so I'll know how, kind of what it sounds like, and send me a lead sheet. I said, okay, what's a lead sheet? <laughs> I didn't know what a lead sheet was. So I said, uh, he said, well, it's just the melody and the chords written out on a piece of paper. I said, oh, well, I've got that. I just didn't know what to call it. So long story short, I got back home that weekend, sent Gary the lead sheet and the tape recording of me playing it on the piano. And in two weeks, we met on a Friday evening. I was gonna to have to work through the weekend to cut over some software at the factory. So I was working through the weekend. So on Friday night, August the 22nd, 1986, at six o'clock in the evening, I met Gary at this tiny little studio. He comes in, wonderful, Inst one of those people, instantly a friend, he's just a great person, friendly. We're both from East, turns out he's from East Tennessee as well, near Oak Ridge, and I'm from Irwin, Tennessee, up in the mountains, not too far away. So we speak the same language, in other words. <laughs> and so we, we're instantly friends and just uh, get to get along ma magnificently. Well, anyway, he comes in with his synthesizer, sets it down, and he goes to the baby grand piano and starts warming up a little bit. I go over into the studio control room, a little tiny room compared to the other one, with the engineer. And pretty soon Gary says, well, okay, I'm ready to record, let's do it. So. The engineer says, okay, I'm ready. So he pushes record on the tape recording machine and on the little speaker thing that Gary can hear, he says, we're rolling. So Gary starts playing Rachel's song on the piano. Now, Crystal, I had never heard my music played by anybody but me. So I had no idea what to expect. You can just imagine my anticipation of what am I gonna hear? Well, I could not believe what I was hearing. This, you know, when you have a professional musician arrange something and perform it for you, I guarantee you, you're going to get blown away. It is, these people are talented. They got talent oozing out of the pores. It is unbelievable. I'm sitting here listening to this. It's unbelievable. Well, he gets almost finished and he stops. Uh, uh oh, what's going on? He says, I can do better than that. So he told the engineer, said, rewind it back. Let's start over. Let's do it again rewind the tape, press record, and start over. This time, he got all the way through it, no mistakes, perfect, absolutely nailed it. And I am just blown away. It, it was the best piano solo I'd, I'd ever heard. And then I thought, well, you know, if he's finished, I'm, I'm happy. He, he comes into the control room and he says, well, I'm not done. He says, I've got some ideas to how to enhance this song, make it really sound special. He said, I want to add some electric piano sound to make that piano sound sound fuller. And then he said, I want to add some bottom and some top. I, it needs some low strings and some high strings, like the violins and bass, you know, bass, the, the string bass. Yes. And um, he said, now in the middle part, he said, I think I need to add some horn sound to give it a little punch. And so he goes back in there, sets up his synthesizer and to the piano sound, two more tracks on the, uh, the recording machine assigned to it, and he plays the electric piano sound while he's listening to his original 
on the on his head headphones like you've got on, and and so he plays along with that and nails it. You can when you listen to the recording, which you will you have heard now that does, uh, Crystal has played it at the beginning. That recording you heard is the demo that I'm talking about. So wow. when that piano sound changed from solo piano to a more richer piano sound, that's when he added the electric piano sound on, on top of it. And then you can remember hearing the, the string sounds as they come in to fill in there. And then in the middle of it, there's some horn sounds that kind of transition from one thing to another. And we, I think we used like eight tracks is all we used for the recording. And then we get all that done and he's done. So Gary comes into the control room and we all, the engineer rewinds it all back and plays it all together. Gary was tickled with it. I was more than tickled with it. I was blown away with how wonderful it sounded. So he, Gary says, well, I think that's it. So I wrote him a check for the agreed upon fee, which wasn't a whole lot, and I paid him and he picked up his synthesizer and hit it out the door. And I had no idea whether I'd ever see Gary again in my life because that was a, you know, as far as I had only written one song, that was it. Well, it turns out that that young man that went out the door would later come back to the studio with me over 170 times over 15 years. We recorded 14, 15 albums worth of music, 120 songs that I ended up writing. And Gary and I have just become the very best of <clears throat> best of friends. And he's, he and his wife, Julie, are like family. It's just an amazing story that started with that one little song that I wrote that got named Rachel's song that got recorded on 1986 that just took on a life of its own. You know, that I remember leaving that studio that night <clears throat> on my way back to the hotel, thinking to myself as I was listening to it on my the car cassette player, this is it. Those words kept ringing in my mind. Now, I didn't know what it was. It's one of those things where you, you, you're, you see something so profound that you don't know how to describe it and you don't know what it's going to lead to. But you, I just felt it in my bones that this was going to be something really special in my life. And it, and it was, it certainly was. That is such an incredible story. As I'm listening to you tell it, it's so clear. And I know you probably didn't see it at the time because sometimes we just don't, but it's so clear to see how God orchestrated all of that to come together and just, and what has come out of just that sitting down at the piano one day to my music director would call doodle, um, you know, just, just to play mm -hmm. and something yeah, exactly. so incredible that has come out of it and how many lives it has touched, not only Rachel's song, but all of the music that you've composed and, you know, that between you and Gary have produced and put out into this world. And I know that it has had, that music has had such an impact on people. And, and Dave, if you have a a story in particular that you can think of, of how your music has impacted the lives of others, I would just be honored for you to share it with our listeners. Well, uh, I've heard from over 50,000 people wow. over the years with their stories of how the music touched their lives. So many that my wife, she spent hours trying to even categorize them into stacks of this was about health, this was about weddings, this was about new babies, you know, all these kind of things that happen. One of the first, <laughs> first letters I ever got was a short one from a lady named Dixon in Atlanta. And she wrote me and she says, and this was around Christmas time, she said, I, I wanted to tell you that I was stuck in a traffic jam in Atlanta, Georgia in Christmas, Christmas traffic jam. She said, and on the radio came Rachel's song. They played it, and she said, I just want you to know that your music turned a terrible traffic jam into a perfectly memorable occasion. So I kind of chuckled, uh, wow, okay. So that was one. But then I got one from a lady in New Jersey. She wrote me and said uh, that she had just completed her training as an emergency medical technician, EMT. And... She said, my husband and I were driving home from her taking the tests and everything on their way home. And in their neighborhood, 
as they were driving down the street on the sidewalk, she looked over and an elderly gentleman just collapsed right on the sidewalk. Oh, and so, of course, you know, she stopped the car and she pulled over and opened the door. She runs over to the man to see if she can find out what the problem is. I, I, I still don't know what it, it might have been a heart attack or a panic attack or who, know, who knows. Anyway, as she got out of the car, left the door open and went over to the man on the car radio, she heard this instrumental music playing and she yelled back at her husband and said, turn that music up loud. And he did. And so she was there comforting the man, trying to, you know, see if she could help him. And she said, by the top, by the time the song had finished playing, the man had calmed down and was okay. And a, a doctor had come by that time to, to take care of him. But she said that music was unbelievably calming to this poor guy who was in a real panic of some kind. Wow. And she said, I just had to tell you because she said, we got home. She said, I called the radio station and said, what was that song that you played at 6.07 p.m. today or whatever it was? And she said, he answered immediately and says, oh, that was Rachel's song. Apparently, that wasn't the first time he'd ever been called about that song. And so he gave her the, my address and the song name and so forth. And that's how she wrote me the letter. And so that letter, the note that she wrote me is in my book on chapter 21. I, I reprinted a whole bunch of these notes like that. And so it's in chapter 21 of my book. And, but it was notes like that. I, another one I got was from a lady who said that she was a recovering alcoholic. And she said, uh, you know, one of the side effects of alcoholism is restlessness and lack of sleep. You know, they just cannot get a good night's sleep. And she said, finally, I got a copy of your Rachel song and she said for the first time in my life since uh, having this particular condition, I got a good night's sleep. After listening to Rachel's song, it calmed me down and I was able to sleep. And she said that your music has just enabled me to maintain my sobriety. She said, I've been a, re I'm a recovering alcoholic. And she said, so thank you for your music, which has helped me maintain my sobriety. So those are like three little little stories, but and I've got fifty thousand of these in boxes. That's why I wrote my book, really, because I had so many stories that that my wife says, "Well, you gotta write this book. We've been talking about it for years. Let's just do it during the pandemic." And that's what I did. But chapter twenty-one, you will enjoy reading. And by the way, you better get your box of Kleenex out too. Some of these stories will bring a tear to your eye too. I mean, they're. <laughs> When my office manager would open the mail every day and she would open the envelopes and pull out the letters and read them and she'd paper clip to some of them a Kleenex so that wow. when I got them, I knew that this, I better sit down and be prepared to, to have shed a tear when I read this note. And they were so touching and so special. And those letters and notes were so confirming and affirming to me that I had done the right thing. I'd made the right decision and that this was indeed something that was a bigger plan than just me, that God had led me down this path and was still guiding me along my way. That is just incredible. It's incredible to listen to even just those few stories that you shared and how amazing that you've taken all of those or you've taken a lot of them and put them into this book. And the name of your book is called Touched by the Music. And of course, we will put the link down in our show notes so that our listeners can go check that out and have an opportunity to purchase it for themselves. But inside this book, Touched by the Music, you not only share the stories of people who have been touched by the music, but what else can our listeners expect to experience when they read your book? Well, I hope those that are of a mind that they might want to do something themselves of an entrepreneurial nature and to share their gifts. And I think this all comes back to the gifts that we're all given. All of us have gifts of various talents, whether it's playing an instrument or in your case, whether it's singing or in your case, a beautiful smile. And, you know, there are there are, all of us have gifts and our our job is to find those gifts and to enhance them now, you know in the bible it talks about the parable of the the talents and i know talent was a measure of money back then but today we call talent is is your gifts and your skills and that kind of thing or you know whether it's music or whatever 
But those, that story resonates with me a lot. And the message is that you're not supposed to hide that talent under a bushel or bury it someplace. You are supposed to water it and feed it and grow it and make sure that it becomes as good as you can make it. And no matter what it is, whether it is that, that wonderful smile you have or whether it's a talent of speaking or writing or performing, it doesn't matter. You, you use that gift. And I think that's the message that, that I have tried to get out there from my book and, and also to inspire people that you take and, and do something. You take action. Action is the one word that it is, I, if you sum up the success of my music business or anybody, an entrepreneur uh, has a tendency to want to be an entrepreneur, taking action with your ideas and your vision of whatever you want to do. And I'm sure you can recall back to when you had the idea that you wanted to do a podcast. Yes. You know, I'm <laughs> sure, you, you know, that was a big decision on your part. Uh, you know, can I do this? How do I do this? What will it, will people listen to it or how will it do? Well, if you just sat there and talked about it forever and ever, you'd still be talking about it and nothing would ever have happened. You took some action to make it happen. And that is an important thing. And once you start that, the, the, the ball rolling with action, there's a, another, I think my friend Jack Canfield likes to talk about the law of attraction. Once you start in that direction, and I think this law of attraction has to do with the, the good, good Lord as well. Once the, God sees that you are seriously going to follow his direction, he's going to help you. He's going to put people in your path and, and that, that will be there. And they'll appear right when they're supposed to and, and get you to where you need to be. And that's where faith comes in. Yes. You don't have to wait until all the stoplights are green before you leave to go to the beach. You just have faith that you're going to get there and you start and you take action and you have some direction and you are, are open to the guidance that you're given and be have your eyes wide open, your senses and your your faith antenna up always listening for the guidance that you need. Absolutely. You know, that's one of the things that I've had a conversation about recently as you know, we get into this place where, okay, well, we think we know what God is leading us to do. We have some kind of idea. We have a dream. You know, we believe that, that God has placed this on our heart. And so we start to take a little bit of action. And that is where, that's where God really shows up is when we take that step of action, that step of faith in obedience to what he's told us to do. You know, that you mentioned this podcast and yes, this is not something I ever thought that I would be doing. And <laughs> at the end of last year, God kind of transitioned me from what I was doing and said, Crystal, I need you to do something else now. You know, I need for you to teach my word. I need for you to tell people what it says. I need for you to explain to people my great love for them. I need you to give them hope. And so me, I was like, Okay, God, I'm going to need you to say that again, slower, because, you know, it, it'll take, it's going to take me a minute. And, and I, he told me that it would be through a podcast. And I was like, all right, well, okay. And I had done live video and all that stuff. So the camera doesn't bother me, you know, talking doesn't bother me anymore. Um, and I was like, all right, a podcast. Okay, cool. And he gave to me, it's going to be daily. The name of this podcast is Daily Bread. You know, it's a walk through the word daily bread. And I procrastinated, like full transparency. I procrastinated. I was like, yeah, that sounds really awesome. And then I was like, oh, daily, like every day you want me to do a daily podcast? I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> well, yeah, okay, cool. And so a few months later, um, of course, it's still rolling around in my mind. I can't really get it out of my head. A few months later, I was really frustrated with something and I just sat down in prayer and I was like, God, I don't understand why I'm so frustrated. Like I did what you told me to do. I don't understand why I'm so frustrated. Is, am I not doing something right? And almost immediately this feeling of, yeah, but you haven't done that podcast yet. You know, like <laughs> I, I told you to do something and you haven't done it yet. So that might be why you're frustrated. And so that was my, um, my urging to say, okay, 
let me figure out how to do this. You know, how do I do this? What is this going to look like? And I just sat down and said, Lord, I don't think I can do a podcast every day. A daily podcast is a lot like that. Really? That's a lot. I don't think I can do that by myself. And again, was like, well, duh, Crystal, you have to have it done with me. You know, like you can't do this on your own. You're going to need me to give you the inspiration, to give you the stamina, to give you, you know, just the motivation to continue to do this every day. And so that was really kind of a beautiful little light bulb moment for me on God shows up for us when we take the action, because we can have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful idea. You created a beautiful song, but if all you ever did was play it for your wife, play it for your family, friends, it would have never been able to move in the way that God has used it. And so what a beautiful lesson in taking that action so that God really can move through us, that he can use us to further the kingdom, that he can use us to help and to heal and to touch lives, that he can really use us as his vessels to, to bring, to bring him glory. I, I love this story so much. Like the whole thing. I love the whole thing. (laughs) I'm so (laughs) glad that you are here to share it with us today. Well, I'm, I'm really happy to, to share it too, especially with the focus on, you know, walk through the word and, and how much we, you and I both, you know, we depend on God's word to help guide us. And then not just his written word, but also his, Spoken word. I think God speaks to every us today. You know, people think, well, you know, God spoke to Moses and all these in person, that kind of thing. Well, yes, but He speaks to us today too. And exactly like the story of the when I quit my job, I was sitting in church one Sunday morning, trying to decide. I was still working at AT and T. This was nineteen and ninety one, like November time frame. And I remember sitting there with my wife before the service actually began, you know, when the organist is playing the, the prelude music and you're, you're, it's kind of a quiet time and you get yourself in a, you know, a worshipful mood. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, Lord, I need some guidance. How am I going to know when is the time for me to say, okay, full-time job at at and it's time to leave that behind and go do your music. When, when am I going to be able to make that decision? I said, I need some guidance, Lord. I need, show me some sign or something that's going to to help me make this decision as to when is the right time. And I'm, and it, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I I had this almost, almost a funny feeling in, and I I laughed inside to myself. I said, Lord, you must think I am the densest Christian on the planet. I said, I've been sitting here waiting for the lightning to strike, waiting for the thunder to roll, waiting for the bush to start burning, all these signs. And you, I said, and here you've sent me thousands of letters from people. So just that week, I got a letter from a man. All he said was, Dave, writing music is what God puts you on this planet to do, period. Signed his name. Wow. And I thought, there's your sign. It gives me chills even thinking about it now because I thought, well, <laughs> here you've you've <laughs> you've sent all these letters to me, and I've been looking from the wrong place. That next Monday, that was Sunday. Monday, I had lunch with my boss and sent, handed him my letter of resignation, and I never looked back. How incredible! How incredible! Dave, thank you so much for being here with us today. I will make sure that all of your information is included in our show notes so that our listeners can connect with you outside of this podcast. It truly has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show today. Well, Crystal, it's been my pleasure too. I've enjoyed every second of it.
Hey friend, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. It's my pleasure as always to be here with you. If what you listened to today resonated with you, if you enjoyed listening to the show, do me a favor, go ahead and like and subscribe to this podcast and leave a review. Those reviews are so helpful. I can't even tell you how much I appreciate each and every single one of them. And go ahead and share this episode out with a friend. Invite them along for a walk through the word and let's enjoy that daily bread together. See you tomorrow.